Okay, so we are live in the Shame Free Zone. I'm Veronica Monet, and my guest tonight is Natalia Price. And we're going to be talking about death. Now, don't don't do that. Don't go to the next page. Stay right here. Um, <laughs> I know it's kind of a scary topic, but you've got to admit that um, the the setting behind Natalia is doesn't it just pull you in? It's so mysterious. And she's a priestess, and I can't wait to hear what she has to gift us with tonight. Uh, Natalia, welcome to the Shame Free Zone. Thank you so much for joining me here. It's such a joy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I like that we're bringing joy to this heavy conversation. You know, I lost a loved one just the evening before Thanksgiving, and I noticed that I, I'm still having you know moments where I'm grieving her passing. And uh, I know there's a lot of people around the globe that have lost loved ones to the pandemic. Here in the United States, we just passed 400,000 people. So whether death has touched us personally um, in, a, in a way that we might readily identify as, oh yes, I lost somebody that I love. I think we are all affected by it because there's kind of this mass loss and this mass grieving taking place right now. And um, so I'm just really glad that you're blessing us with your presence. And I want to make sure our viewers know a little bit more about you. So I'm going to, I'm going to read your bio right now, because it's, it's fascinating, exciting, intriguing. I love the way it starts, Natalia. Um, in this current life, Natalia Price is an, ador an ordained priestess and a focalizer of the 13 Moon Mystery School. She has been involved with the 13 Moon work and its founder, Ariel Spilsbury, for 17 years. And she's drawing in for inspiration from her journeys as a ritual theater performance artist, a yoga instructor, a ceremonialist, a gypsy. And she facilitates ceremonies, retreats, and initiations to support and inspire beings in aligning with their feminine wisdom and embodying their full glory and true essence. She was born and raised all over South America with Argentinian and Welsh blood. Natalia has traveled the world following her inner call for the sacred, Mother Earth, and the embodiment of the divine feminine in all cultures, places, and people, especially sacred sites. Her spiritual lineage is that of ancient Egypt, of the temples of Isis and Hathor, aligning her inner compass to the ritual arts and remembrance of those times of service to the mother in all. The midwifing into death of some of Natalia's closest beloveds initiated her into the deeper realms of death and guided her into the role of temple keeper of the queen of death for the sanctuary of the open heart. Natalia became certified as a death doula and works with the Full Circle Living and Dying Collective to transform and reclaim our relationship and ritual with the death process. And Natalia, just before we went live, you told me that the beautiful temple setting behind you is actually in honor of the Queen of Death. Is that true? Yes. We are right now in my 13 Moon Mystery School. We are journeying with her for yeah. uh, about for a whole moon time of traveling mm -hmm. deep into the magic and the mystery of death. Well, can when you talk about the magic and the mystery of death, so for a lot of us, our initial response to death is a lot of grief and sometimes fear. So help us understand what you mean when you talk about magic and mystery. I feel that death has been something that has been taken from us in many ways by you could say the patriarchy or the medical system or the powers that be that I feel in many way have disempowered us in the same way that birth has been taken away or even our sexuality. They've all become these taboo subjects. And yet it's something that's happening in every moment that each one of us is going to meet this moment and all of our beloveds. And it's a natural part, a natural cycle of life. And I believe the more intimate that we become with death, the more we 
speak about it, the more we commune with it, but the more we, we communicate in our world around it, the richer our lives will be bringing back this sacred back into us and, and reclaiming it as part of our life journey here. And I feel it's many parts of taking the shadow away from it. And instead of having it be something that we put off, you know, that we give to the funeral home or the hospitals, or we give this power to someone else that we can bring it back into our homes. Yeah. And I think especially in family, it helps us grieve better. It helps us have better bereavement. It helps each person play a part in the death and dying process. And even with children, to talk about death with children at a young age so that they can see it as a natural part of life. And so we can embrace so many natural aspects that all come in line with it, even such as aging or physical illness or in the sense, it's very much of a, a shamanic death aspect that we release parts of ourselves that aren't serving us, that in some way are, you could say, inauthentic to us truly living. Right, right. You know, it's interesting you talked about helping children understand uh, death. I, I certainly know it's helpful if children are actually there for the birth process um, so that they understand where life comes from and share in maybe the arrival of a sibling. I'm thinking back to when I was like eight years old and I remember I must have just finally gotten the fact that my mother would die someday. And by the way, she's still alive. So it, it's fascinating to me that at age eight, I was like crying about the fact that she's gonna die. And my mother says, what are you crying about? And I'm going, you're gonna die someday. And she goes, well, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and, but there was a way in which I wasn't getting shepherded into a relationship with death where at that tender age, I could comprehend it and have any kind of acceptance around it. It felt very jarring, frightening, foreign. Um, so, I, I, you know, I didn't expect to kind of ask you this question right out of the gate, but since you mentioned children, what would be a good way for parents to uh, help their children um, conceptualize death in a way that's maybe not so traumatic? I think one is just talking about it and talking about the normalcy of death, talking about nature dying, talking about the animals dying, our plants, our gardens, the cycles of life, even tuning in, you could say, to the cycles of the seasons, the cycles of the moon. And I think in many ways, grandparents are, in, and partly they really teach children about the impermanence of life. And often when a grandparent passes, it might be the first time that children are really met with it. That we're not trying to um, hide it from them and that it doesn't need to be this horrible thing. You know, and I think just communicating with them. You know, for me, my son was four years old when my father passed. And we, you know, we were there midwifing his death. And then even, you know, when he passed, I had my son come and touch him and feel what it is like to touch someone who has passed away and you know say his final prayer the final things he wanted to say to my grandfather and demystify it in many ways and make it personal mm. yeah wow when you're talking about touching a dead body it makes me think about um about five years ago my stepfather passed and he was in a lot of pain. He had um, stomach cancer and it was very, very painful for him. And he uh, had already gone through chemo and everything and recovered once and got another six years. And then, and then he decided just didn't want to put himself through that anymore. But the, the day that he died, um, I was there about 60 seconds after he took his last breath. And it was one of the most romantic scenes I've ever seen he had his arms around my mother's waist and um, she actually wanted me to take a picture of it. I was like, oh, do I dare? Is that profane to take a picture of this? But I did, I took a picture of his, his dead arms around her. Um, and, then, and then we released um, his embrace. And we sat there, it was my mother, my stepsister and I, uh, sat there and, and uh, laughed and joked and had our lunch. And it was very much like he was still in the room with us. 
uh, we were talking with him, making jokes at his expense. And um, it was great. It was glorious. I literally, when I walked in and I saw uh, that he had just died, I remember raising my hands to the heavens in praise because I just, I knew that he was no longer in pain. And I've had experiences of, of contacting the other side. So I, I knew it wasn't like he had ceased to exist. But Natalia, when I went over to take his watch and his wedding ring off at my mother's request, my body registered something that my heart and my spirit hadn't experienced. And I started screaming like a wounded animal. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that it's possible that our bodies have a fear of death that our hearts and souls could learn not to have? Or, or do you think that was just maybe, you know, specific to me? I'm just wondering, because you're a death doula, what how your interpretation of that might be. I think everybody has their own response to death. And a lot of that, I believe, has to do with our own conditioning around it. And in many ways, what is the, the grief that we've been carrying? And, you know, I think part of the gift of death is it makes us really look at ourselves and what we're carrying. Mm -hmm. And if there is a lot of things that we've just been holding hard to or just stuffing under, death really has us look at that and look at our own impermanence. And it could also even be, I believe, um, that whole belief system from our culture, from our conditioning, from our upbringing that's coming up that's and also really making us look at our own life mm -hmm. how are we living right because so often uh, when somebody passes they're they're gone they've gone to another place and we're not necessarily grieving for them or grieving for us and our life with the loss of them or what they make us look at ourselves about and you know it might be regrets or how we want to live greater bigger so perhaps in that moment, it was just bringing up a deeper part, even I could say a cultural aspect, you know, and there are in some cultures where they have wailers that come and they wail and they cry, almost in a sense for the whole community to release whatever is pent up that we all have. And along with that really is that fear of death that is so has us all in, in a grip that you see right now in our whole country around this COVID that the, the biggest thing really is this fear of death. Because if it's something that there's a 99.5% chance of recovering and we're so afraid. And I think in many ways, if all of us started cultivating a new relationship around death and dying, that we could come into a better place with this fear, that we could look at it, that we could disarm it and see the way it stops us from fully living. Now, you mentioned COVID, and I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that um, a lot of people have lost their loved ones without actually being able to say goodbye to them in person. And um, in my case, um, my, my cousin died the night before Thanksgiving. Um, she didn't have COVID. She had cancer. I had every intention of going out to see her, but there were just so many obstacles in the way with um, the uh, quarantines and, and then the household got exposed to COVID. And so it really wasn't safe. So I, I am not unique in this. And there's a lot of people who lost their loved ones to COVID. I'm wondering, since you are a death doula, I would imagine that ritual is, is something that you help people with. Um, the ritual that we ended up having was an online memorial. And you know, there wasn't that same hugging each other and crying together that I associate with the grieving process that can, can, for myself, you know, maybe this isn't true for everybody, but for myself, I always found that to be very healing and create some kind of closure. So I think what I'm, I'm wanting to know is, can you speak to the people who have been in that situation this last nine months of living, losing someone that they love, but not being able to be there and then not having the funeral. Um, I know some people have had funerals, but a lot of people haven't. They've had online memorials. What, what kind of ritual 
can they bring into their lives that would give them um, more closure, more healing? That's a really important aspect, I believe, because often, even beyond the COVID, there is this that we don't get that opportunity to show up before or even come to the funeral. But if we really trust in this divine force that's greater than us, that's greater than our physical bodies, and that knowing that all time and space is one, I think when, when as humans, we put so much pressure that we have to um, show up to the funeral. We needed to have seen them before they passed. And then we especially hold on to that, like, oh, I, you know, I wasn't allowed to go into the hospital. And they almost use it as to add deeper suffering and deeper pain to this mm -hmm. process. And in many ways, guilty as charged. Yeah, that there's <laughs> an aspect of us. beating myself up. Oh my God, it's really bad. Yeah then in one sense, we need to just accept what was, that we couldn't be there, that it didn't work out the way it was supposed to, or the way we planned or wanted it to, or the funeral wasn't what it was. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we need to lay that down, right? And I understand it's very much part of the bereavement, but it's almost as if it adds grief to the process that doesn't necessarily need to be there because what we really want to be focusing on is that beloved and the love you have and because we have this ability to communicate with beyond with those that have passed and they're so close you know from studying so many different cultures and indigenous practices knowing that they're still here and they're still available to us and they're listening to us and they're working with us mm. but i think in whatever way for each person and, and yes, coming together, even, you know, Zoom, whatever ways that, you know, is a group coming together. But I think also for each person to make peace in a way with the passing and especially in times where it's been a violent passing or a, a sudden passing, right? Where we didn't have time to prepare for death to even as something as simple as lighting a candle for that person centering ourselves, you know, creating, coming in, creating the sacred in whichever way each one of us has, you know, through breath practice, through creating sacred space, through creating mm -hmm. ritual. But even in the simplest, is just honoring in that reverence of silence, of holding space, of honoring them. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps, you know, calling to mind, invoking, the things we loved about this beloved, the ways that we honor that they lived their life, um, you know, good things that we want to hold on to and to remember. Because I often see that when, when people have passed, people will keep talking about their illness or poor them, or gosh, it was so horrible that this, that, and it was like, let's not remember them that way. Let's remember the glory of their life and, and the person they were. Mm -hmm. You know, often even I find that people's pain body wants to hold on to a bad moment that they weren't able to clear, that maybe they didn't have to reach to a place of forgiveness or mm -hmm. regret or resentments. Mm -hmm. And so in this time, make peace with that, lay that down, and not only for yourself, but for them. So the two of you can have this newfound relationship and this deep healing that they can also offer us through their passing and the peace that they can give us. But it's really through our own choice and our intention and our presence to that and how we choose to feed that, you know, with, with, our, with our love, with our intentionality, with, you know, being in the sacred with it. Hmm. Hmm. And if it helps one to be in nature, to maybe bury something in the ground, it could be a crystal, a stone, hmm. or, you know, make offerings to a tree cry with the earth. Yeah. I like that, make offerings to a tree. But it doesn't need to look, because our society is given this idea of funeral. And, and even at the funeral, there's all many inauthentic aspects of a funeral that we're always not necessarily in alignment with either. We could be religious or patriarchal or that they're in some coffin or whatnot. And so for each one, just to make peace in our own way, in our own time, and how important it is for our peace, but I think also even for them 
to be able to leave us to know that, that we have spent the time to cultivate a new way of how we're choosing to honor their death. Yeah, can you say a little bit? Because I know maybe for some of us, it's easy to uh, communicate with those that have passed to the other side. And then for others, it may not be quite as easy. Um, I know after my stepfather passed, we had a lot of conversations for the first several months, actually. Um, it was like he was making sure that I had the keys to the car, uh, if you will, because there was a whole bunch of stuff my mother's dementia prevented her from understanding. And I was going through all the finances. And, and at one particular point, um, my mom really wanted to watch something on the television. Well, this television was hooked up to a VCR and she wanted to watch something on the VCR. This was no ordinary setup. It was old and it was very difficult to figure out. You ended up having to use three different remote controls in a very specific order. And there was also something that had to be plugged into the wall. My mother had no clue and I didn't have any clue. So I just started talking to I called him daddy. I was like, daddy, I need your help. I don't, I have no clue how to do this. And mom really wants to watch this. So I got a little nudge, do this. And, and so I, I got this one remote control and I made this one thing happen. And then I was like, well, and then what? Now what? Now what? And, and then he was like, okay, now do this. And I did the second step and I still was completely lost. And then I did the third and the fourth and it worked. And the DVD that my mother ended up selecting was one of his favorites. It was a Green Bay Packers. And I was just like, it was such a magical moment. And so, you know, he's further away now. I, I don't need as much guidance from him, but I was so glad he was there. And I, I think about, for some people that may not be available to them intuitively i'm hearing you say that it's available to all of us it is it do you really have any anything that you could share with people who might not have had that experience that's how they could bring that in yes you know i believe that all of us have this ability of mediumship in some level over another even if it's just an organic intuitive just as you did but I think just especially talking to them is so important for them and really for us, because it's a way that we are processing, that our whole psyche is, is connecting, is letting go, is in many ways normalizing. And so that calling them in in moments, in moments that, of course, you know, we'll do it in moments that we need their help. But often it's even in moments of great joy of, look, honey, I see this, you see these flowers. And then often you'll see like some symbol of them show up. I think when we just open ourselves and become more creative mm. and more holistic and more expansive to, to allowing that what you might call the mystery to come in, being open to receive messages from them and, and listening for them and, 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 and trusting in them. Right when you know, for my brother that passed, you know, our symbol was a hummingbird, and then when I have really profound things happen, of course, a hummingbird shows up, and I say, "Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for coming to acknowledge it." In the same way, how we often speak about like synchronicities, that the more that we start to pay attention to synchronicities, the more they start to happen. Our intuition, the more we speak, the more it connects and keeps speaking to us. So I think the same thing with those that have passed that the more that we talk, that we connect, that we light candles, that we make a toast for them, that we keep including them at the dinner table or at Christmas, whatever those pieces, I believe that they, they love it, that they're included. You know, up here, up above, I don't know if you can see on this altar is what's called a Japanese ancestors altar. Beautiful. And this is an ancient Japanese altar where people would keep the ashes of their beloveds. And every day they would have them there, they would open them, they would give them incense, they would talk to them, make offerings, and then at night close them. Mm -hmm. In many ancient you know, cultures, there was this honoring of those that have passed. 
And I feel sometimes in this new age where people are like, oh, don't mess with the dead. Don't trouble them with things. I actually had somebody tell me that. Yeah, see, I, 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 shared, I shared with them that I was talking to my stepdad and, and I got reprimanded. I believe it's very much of like religion, of organized religion of the church, making up certain rules or boundaries about any of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that spirit or the divine has those kind of things. If they truly didn't want us to connect with them, I believe they would let us know or, or you know, things would happen. But I believe it's another way that the patriarchy has shut us down to that part of the magic or receiving guidance from those that have passed. Oh, thank you for that. I think that is so powerful what you just said. And I have to say, when you were talking about talking to our loved ones that have passed, um, I, there was a combination of things. We were talking about how we need to let go that their passing wasn't the way we wanted it to be. And, and listening to you and really taking that in, I was letting go of any guilt and shame I had about not getting there in time to see my cousin before she died. And I, and I, I can feel tearful about that. And then when you're talking about how they need to hear from us, I realized that that shame was blocking me from connecting with her. And my whole body just started to vibrate. And I was just like, yes, I am gonna go make an offering to a tree and I'm gonna start including her and, and talking to her. And I, this feels like such a, a beautiful opening that you create. Can you just say a little bit more about why our beloveds that have passed to the other side need to hear from us? I don't know if they necessarily need but I definitely believe that that connection is there and they are still, especially for some time before they completely cross over, that they want to know they've been loved. They want to know that their life meant something, that they were of service, that there was deeper meaning in their life. And, I, and often I think our bereavement and our grief offers them that. But if we get stuck in some way around shame and guilt and, and stuck on how we wanted their death to be, yeah. or how we should have been there, we're starting to make it about us once mm -hmm. again, uh -huh. instead of honoring that we don't know, we're seeing this all from a very limited human perspective, right. so even the suffering or the hospital or the doctors, but perhaps there's some karmic story or some learning that they're receiving Mm -hmm. Or that when they pass, they're not holding on to it anymore, that they had cancer. They're not remembering yeah. their suffering of cancer. They're holding on to the beauty of life and the beauty of their beloveds. Yeah. So for us to really do that work, to, 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 you know, to let it go for ourselves and ultimately to forgive ourselves so that then we can have a loving, so that when we think of them, we are uplifted, that our vibration is raised. I'm sure they would love that for us, right? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't they hate that for the next 10 years that we're still feeling bad about some small little thing? Mm -hmm. They would want us, they want us to be happy. They, they want to love us up and guide us. Mm. Well, I have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I am really enjoying um, uh, your death doula priestessing. But, and can you explain a little bit more about what exactly a death doula does? So there's many roles and many definitions of a death doula. And there's some that are more in a clinical way or working with nurses or working in paleotic, paleotic care or in, in hospice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as of now, there's not an exact way of what it is or what, you know, how it goes. And so I believe that really for each person wanting to work in that, or even for a person that's looking for someone to come and help them, I really feel that it's about really finding a relationship that is a good match for each one of, of interviewing them. But for a person that wants to enter into that, yes, there's so many, um, let's say a course or a certification that you can get to become a certified, uh, you can, they're either called uh, a doula, uh, a death mid midwife, or a death walker. Mm 
And so for different people, that road might look differently, but I feel the most important part is really for people to do the inner work, for them to find peace with their own relationship around death and dying. Because so much of that work is really our energy and our vibration and our presence that is healing for those that we are assisting. Hmm. And that we are here to, to support them and encourage you know, either the person through their death and dying process and the family, but we're not here to do it all for them. Because yeah. I feel anyway that disempowers them. Or once again, it's like they're just handing it over. And their 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 bereavement and their death process would be so much more served if they can really be a part. Mm-hmm. And so really questioning and and questioning people who are, you know, in this process of dying, how would you like to die? Um, create a death plan for them. How would you like to be if you're going to the hospital, um, if you have organ failure, things like um, who would you like to take over care of all your finances? You know, of course there's a legal aspects, but then there's also spiritual aspects. Like how many people would you like in the room? Would you like there to be music playing? Do you want to stay at the hospital? Like I think There's so many things that we are, there's a taboo to talk about, and yet it's important. I was really grateful that my father really arranged a lot for his death process. Like he already had his, um, where he was gonna be buried. He had all that um, organized and paid for, you know, and and those things set into motion. Cause even the few decisions that we had to make as a family, like, you know, what are we gonna put on his tombstone? That also just creates, it can create turmoil in a family for everyone to agree. And then there's of course all the finances or giving away of personal belongings. And the more that people can be in charge of it, I feel the more empowered they are. Mm. So that in the moment of the death, there's greater peace for them to know that others, you know, as you were speaking about uh, your father-in-law or stepfather that, um, you know, there were pieces that hadn't gotten completed for it to be smoother and so as yeah. much as possible for us to talk about it with them, to, yeah. be, to listen to them talk about what it feels like to die, ask them those things. Mm. Yeah, we went on, uh, my mother has a living trust now. <laughs> we didn't want anything messy going forward here. Um, I know that your, um, this gorgeous temple that's behind you is going to come down and you're going to move from the queen of death to another goddess. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I work in the 13 moon mystery school where we work with 13 archetypes of the divine feminine and they're different faces of ourselves truly that we enter into and get to know. And so the queen of death is the the 12th one And yes, we're dealing with physical death, but we really also are looking at a shamanic death or what are the things that we want to release in ourselves so that we can enter into death peacefully? What are the aspects that we need to forgive that we need to fully lay down and be done with so that we can really be rebirthed into living our true essence, our true life? You know, for many of us, it could be parts of our childhood or trauma or, you know, regrets but to consciously look, face those shadows. And then when we do a lot of this work together, ultimately we come, when we finish, we enter into the next archetype is the alchemical goddess. And she is the one that holds all the archetypes together. And hers is this radiant rainbow golden body that is this marriage of the masculine and feminine within ourselves that marries this life and death the the Shiva, the Shakti, the shadow and the light, that she's holding all these aspects. And in a sense, what are we celebrating about who we are in our purpose, in in the way that we are choosing to be of service on the planet and to dive deeper into investigating those pieces within us. And especially the shadow aspect of what what stops us from truly living in our glory and being in our static true nature and clearing the shadow, the cobwebs to really truly look at ourselves and become 
to know ourselves and land right here in the heart and self mastery. Hmm. Not from some idea of like the divine out there, but how can we really honor what's in here as this temple? And in that sense of spiritual alchemy that raises our vibrations for us to fully live now. Hmm. I love that. Letting go of the things that no longer serve us and moving into the celebration of our masculine and feminine energy. And it's beautiful timing too. So um, before I ask you about your offerings and how people can contact you, can you just tell us a little bit more about what it means to you to be a priestess? The path of the priestess, I think, is unique to every man or woman who enters into it. And I think often from the outside, there's this word a priest has a lot of glory or radiance and also mystique. But for me, it's truly about a path of being of service. And each one of us are called to service in a different way. And I know for many years myself, I was asking, what does my path look like in a, in a physical sense? You know, because so many of us, we have this spiritual life that we have in here that maybe is on our mat or in front of the altar or in our meditation. But how are we really taking it into the world? Mm -hmm. And even oftentimes we might have a, a job as a whatever, a banker, or a teacher, anything that's, you know, what someone might say, a job that's of the world, but when we bring our priestessing into it, how are we bringing our full presence to the moment in a way where we can look at what, what is needing here to, to, be, to be presence, to be brought to the forefront, to be communicated, to be laid to rest, and then how to find ways to do it. You know, often, you know, as a priestess, we do it through ceremony or ritual. But often, you know, for a day-to-day -day person or their daily life, they haven't quite accessed that or found that path for themselves. And so often we might have a mentor or a teacher or a guide or a priest, you know, in many ways that, that help us in that way of the sacred. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm really in a place right now in my life of reclaiming this word priestess, of bringing it back into this modern day light. Because in our world, we see priest, we see the word priest that's held in a Christian um, or Catholic or a very religious way that the patriarchy has taken it, that a man is a priest. Right. And so we're bringing back this word priestess of the ancient times of Avalon, of ancient Egypt, of, you know, of numerous cultures that have held priestesses, but they've had to go under. They've been, you know, desecrated or they've been removed in many ways to disempower the feminine. And so for me, part of the rising of the feminine and of bringing us back into balance with the masculine to bring our planet back into balance, you see there has been this lack of the mother, the lack of the feminine. You see everyone in power is a man, every corporation, everything that holds, makes decisions, every, the, the cars we drive, the homes we live in, everything is made from a male mind. And you can see that the world needs this balance, that we are so far off track now. And so just bringing the, the feminine up, not in a way to be above the masculine, but to be together, to come, you know, come together in this way of weaving the beauty that each one of us holds and to exalt the masculine into his goodness, to protect, to serve, and for the women to bring in this, this beauty of inclusivity, of unconditional love, of compassion, that all of that needs to, to come to birth in this new world that we're all seeding together. And even on this day that we see that there's a feminine woman stepping into a, play, a position of power, it's a beautiful day for you know, the divine feminine. It is a beautiful day for the divine feminine. You know, Natalia, I have memory of a past life in Egypt. Um, and it's a fraught lifetime. I was, I was um, killed um, before my time. And in a, in a lot of ways, it was because I was bringing that uh, priestess energy in a sexual, sensual way. And I've been really trying to reconnect with that, that past life because there's a, some power that I left behind. 
Um, and when you're talking about bringing the divine feminine up, I just, I have a question for you. And this is a personal question. Um, I've been really getting a lot of messages about BAST. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I don't even know if it's a god or a goddess. I just know it's a, it's a cat with red wings. Oh, of course, it's right there. <laughs> I have many of them in my home. Of, oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> the synchronicity. Um, what? I work with a lot. Oh, my God. Okay, well, um, this has been, this is a very intense interview. I feel like it's, it's way more than an interview. So what, what might Bast want to teach me, teach us? What, what kind of uh, message, medicine, magic, um, mystery can Bast bring to us? So Bast, as we know her now, or some call her Bastet, she was a cat-headed goddess. And she was often the god okay. of the home, of the hearth. And many women would have a little altar to Bastet. And her other counterpart is Sekhmet. But I also have her here where she was a lion-headed goddess. Oh. And she was the more fierce of that primal Shakti. Okay. Whereas Bass was this very loving mothering, like the mother cat with her kittens. And mm -hmm. Sekhmet is the one that's the fierce warrioress that's going to stand and fight and be fierce and give us courage. And bringing in that feline power that works very much in, with the intuitive realms and that inner listening. And I feel for you, especially when you're asking me about priestessing, for what I sense in you is the way that you brought your priestessing into the world is part of this work that you're doing now. And even as you were saying, it working as a sexologist, yes. bringing this work of the sacred sexuality that yes. is so needed. There's one of the most pivotal things that's needed on our planet right now is with this balancing of the masculine and feminine is this balancing of the sacred sexuality mm -hmm. and how crucial it is for the healing of us to be whole and complete beings. And just as death and birth became this taboo subject, so was sex. Oh, yeah. and sacred sexuality and the sacred priestesses that worked in different temples through on eons of time and even we have all these reports of the sacred priestesses in Greece, that when the men would come back from war, they would heal them. Yes. Yeah. And, and a healing of a whole mind, body, spirit of a human. And so I feel like that's where your work has come back of, of bringing people to honor their sexuality. Wow. Well, you, you definitely read me. And I feel so reframed around Bast now because that, that image keeps coming to me in my meditation and uh, some of my sacred sexual practices. So um, I'm getting that it's feminine, it's, it's a goddess. And I'm also getting that, um, that she is, is bringing that sacred sexual. So thank you for that. And it's just perfect for here in the shame-free zone where I'm often talking about sacred sexuality. And so um, connect with her more, um, yeah. you know, meditate with her, write with her, do some research with her, but really create your own relationship. Yes, and, I, and I, you're bringing ancient wisdom intuitively, energetically, that cannot necessarily always be found in research. So I have looked up things about Bast and none of it really spoke to me as, as, as deeply and, and well as you just did. Um, and that's where I think sometimes, you know, again, the patriarchy has co-opted the interpretation even of these, these ancient uh, truths. And so it's, it can be difficult sometimes to unearth them and connect with them. So I thank you. Thank you very much. I really believe that so many of these gods and goddesses that we see out there, especially when they're showing up in our meditations or in our dream time or just in our imaginations, they're speaking through us and they're wanting us to commune with them within in an organic way that don't necessarily that we have to go look for the information out there for someone to validate it but it's for us 
to, as in anything in life that we feel passionate about, commune with it, dream with it, invoke it in those inner realms, mm. you know, in that empty stillness to see what comes through, what arises. I am going to do that, definitely. Natalia, you're very special. I, I'm sure that um, our viewers would love to know how they can contact you. I'm sure we're going to have some people here locally. And also, of course, this is just going to go out uh, worldwide. So um, can you tell us, first of all, what it is that you're offering for them and then how they can contact you? Thank you. I, I'm a priestess and facilitator of the 13 Moon Mystery School. And I am finishing now an online program that I have a year long program and I'm about to begin a new one here in February. It's a 13 month program where we travel through 13 archetypes of the divine feminine to get to know ourselves, to get to know the different faces of who we are and how the divine lives within us by looking at unearthing those deeper shadow pieces of us so that we can really make peace and that we can really step into our power to find our voice, to be able to share our wisdom and really come to do the work that we came here to do, to be of service, to shine for all beings. And so this is a program that's starting February 13th, right before Valentine's Day to really enter into what real unconditional love is with the self and to begin that relationship with us and the mother that lives within us. And you can find my work um, on my website, which is Natalia Price. This is my name, nataliaprice.com. And there I have the work about the online program and even other offerings that I do. I also offer drop-in full moon circles that I do every moon that one is coming up next Wednesday on November 27th that I'm offering that it's by donation. And we're actually working with the alchemical goddess of working on how each one of us can really raise a vibration and come into greater balance of that masculine and feminine to that inner marriage. Mm -hmm. And so on my website, you can also find that to sign up and it's a, a Zoom call. And there's about 40 of us where people get to share and chat and, and set intentions to really amplify this energy of, you know, cause this full moon is gonna be in Leo, which is that feline energy once again for you, Veronica. <laughs> coming in and how to it's you know the feline is that heart that open heart of the leo to radiate our our gifts our beauty of who we are in this life mm. gorgeous just gorgeous thank you for that thank you and then also i'm on instagram and italia.price and the same facebook i have a 13 moon priestess sisterhood community where I also put those, um, the full moon circles on live there. And we will we'll include all these links at the bottom too. So that, um, yeah, wonderful. Well, you are just exactly what we need to kick off this, this new reality that we're all entering into. And um, thank you for making such beautiful contributions to my own personal journey. Really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. I, I, it is just such a joy for me to serve and to see when it lights people up and it radiates and especially someone like you who's doing such good work out in the world and it amplifies and it magnifies out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the gifts that you gave me are going to become gifts for a lot of people. So I'm bowing to you mm. so much. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Veronica. Blessed be. Blessed be. Mm.